right. Well, today we have a special speaker that's going to be coming to speak for us. And he's been um, part of Branches for a long time now. But go ahead and come up at Ken. So thank you guys so much. And welcome in. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not Jake. It's always a surprise when the pastor is not up here. And it, I tell you, it's as much a surprise to me to be up here as well. Um, I've, I've given us a room before, but let me tell you. Um, oh, wrong way. All right. I'm talking about John 8, 1 through 30 today. And I actually had a really good time going through this passage and kind of sorting out my thoughts here. And so I, I hope you'll have a good time as we walk through it. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll find something that, that um, plays out in our lives this week, right? So um, John 8, um, 1 through 30, uh, it, when Jake kind of sent me this passage, he summarized it as the good judgment of Jesus. And that's actually a really succinct, nice summary of what it is. But when you read it, you kind of feel at first glance that this is, these are two different parts to it, and they're not necessarily related. But once you actually look more closely, you see they are definitely, definitely connected to each other. So one of the things that, that happens to me when I, um, let me walk over here because I'm about to open. All right, so one of the things that happens to me when I, I kind of read the Bible is, you know, they, they've got those, those section headers in the Bible, right? You know, it's, a, it's kind of like a summary of what you're about to read. And then in my mind, when I get to the end of the section, there's a new header, I, I like to wrap everything up, you know, and say, okay, that's the end of that next topic, right? And so if you, if you look through it, you see that these section headers are different depending on the translation or who the editor was. So, you know, I, I pulled a few of these from BibleGateway.com. I took a picture of my actual physical printed copy of an NIV study Bible. You see, like, um, in the New King James, it starts off with Jesus, the light of the world. And in the NIV study Bible, there's actually no header there at all. And then when you get down to um, verse 12 and 13, New King James, at least the editor of that version, said Jesus defends his self-witness. But then if you look in the NIV, it says something different. And so when I first read this, you know, I got to uh, the end of verse 11. And I'm like, all right, section closed, right? <laughs> but um, as much as those are useful, and I like them because I, I like an organized kind of person <laughs> sometimes. Um, sometimes they kind of lead us to like stop and not make the connection. And there's a reason why one through 30 are all there together because they are connected. So, um, right. So if we could summarize this, we would say the first part is an example of what God has in mind when it comes to judgment. And then the second part helps us understand where that authority that Jesus had to make that judgment came from and why it's, in, it's important to understand where it comes from. All right, so let's get into the first part then. So it goes like this. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now in early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Right? And so now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They, they said, this they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to, him, said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Must have been awkward, right? <laughs> and then again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman was standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. All right, so that's that's where so you, you get that, that header. <laughs> and so you tend to like stop, all right? That's a distinct story, right? Um, the first thing you want to ask, though, is what's going on here? Um, and the first conclusion 
that I drew was they didn't really care about God's law. And let me show you Deuteronomy 22.22 and Leviticus 20.10 to, sh to show you why. Actually, when I was reading through this, the, the first thing Kathy said to me was, well, where's the guy? Right? Because you can't, this thing can't happen by itself, right? And that's actually a really, really good point. The guy was conveniently missing from this, this show as Jesus was standing in public talking. Um, and, you know, if you, if you dig into the commentaries and, 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 and read about it a little, um, it, it's, it's pretty much thought that to actually stone someone for this, you needed two witnesses that agreed completely. And so usually you don't have a bunch of witnesses to stuff like this happening. So this was a setup. It was definitely a setup. And so they probably knew this was going on. They had some people spy on them. So rather than convincing them to stop sinning, they were like, yeah, we're going to use this uh, to um, gain an advantage over, over someone that we don't like. Okay, so that's not caring about God's law. That's using it for our own selfish purposes. Right. Right. So just to just to show you, it's always good to like really um, go back and see you know what they're talking about. They re they reference the law, right? Deuteronomy twenty two twenty two. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both both of them shall die. And then Leviticus, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor wife neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. All right. So. They were kind of picking and choosing the parts they liked. They weren't really concerned about being faithful to that law. They were concerned about how they could use this for themselves. The second thing that's going on, and they, it even states this directly in the passage, is they're trying to get Jesus in trouble. So if you think about this, no matter what Jesus would have said, he said, yeah, stone her, or no, don't stone her, someone would have been mad, mad at him. So in the, in the Gospels especially, um, you know, I've noticed that you often see references to the Pharisees. Sometimes you see references to the Sadducees, the scribes, the Roman authorities. Uh, and, you know, especially for the, the, the Jewish sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, you kind of lump them all together in your head. But the reality is those were different groups and factions of people, and they did not see eye to eye on a lot of things. So, for instance, the Pharisees, um, they had a complex web that combined scripture, uh, oral tradition, and at least at least in name, right? They were known as the people who preached ethics and were champions of human equality. Now, in practice, did that always play out in the way we would think of those things? No. But that that is, according to the research, kind of how they were known. Now, the Sadducees, they interpreted Mosaic law as literal and binding. And so none of, none of this oral tradition, you know, do not try to shove ethics in there. Uh, this is what it says, you better follow it. And then of course the Romans, they were in physical control. And so as far as stoning someone to death, you can kind of think that they would react this way. It's like, no, no, <laughs> we do the killing around these parts because we're in control. So you're in trouble if you do that. In fact, you know, if you, if you look a little bit further ahead in John, um, when um, they brought uh, Jesus to Pilate, uh, they, they even admit to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Okay, so they could either tick off the Sadducees by, or Jesus could tick off them by not stoning her, or perhaps by also not stoning the guy. They could tick off the Pharisees because maybe if he stones them, it's not ethical. Maybe if he does, he didn't follow the rest of the law. There's all that oral tradition. And then the Romans just, they were like, no, no, <laughs> you know, we, we've got a grip on this. So this was a setup, right? It wasn't really about doing what's right and wrong. It was trying to twist judgment in a way that served their own human interests. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so, at, so after asking myself what's going on here, then we move on to, well, what does this teach me? What does this teach us? Uh, so obviously, what it's not teaching us is convenient ways to set someone up, right? <laughs> and it's not a, actually even a warning about, hey, the, people might try to trick you in this way, right? So that happened, but that's not the point of the scripture. What it is teaching us is, first, we are too sinful to have the authority on our own to judge someone. Uh, we're going to twist it. 
God alone is the true authority and the source of right and wrong. So as Jesus gives God's example of how he would like people to be treated, um, that's what we should follow. And um, this is, I almost take this as a warning to myself, to all of us, that it's in our nature to twist things to serve our own interests. We're simple, we're selfish. Uh, you know, it, it's easy, kind of like, you know, if you listen to sermons and read the scripture a lot, the Pharisees, they're, they're like the, they're like, um, like the bad guys, right? And we think, oh, this, this, this guy's mess it up all the time. But really, we do that. Right. We do that all the time, right? We're, we're not immune to that at all. Um, the, other, the other thing I saw here is, you know, there is forgiveness. But Jesus still points out to the woman, yeah, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that. that that's sin. And so that's actually, you know, as I sat down and thought about it, that's kind of a complex nuance to navigate. Because um, at least in our modern culture, we tend to either paint people as the victim or people as the villain, right? And so you don't need to say the woman was completely innocent to say that she was deserving of God's forgiveness. Amen. And you don't need to ostracize her and say she's not redeemable either. Amen. Everyone is eligible for forgiveness Amen. if you accept it, right? So um, you don't have to qualify that. And that that's, that's really tough for us to get sometimes, at least for me, right? I tend to like this bucket – this bucket, nothing in between, all right? So, um, okay, so then after, you know, what is the, you know, what is, what is, what is the application? Then I start asking myself, okay, what does this actually mean for my life? And so um, a long, long time ago, um, I was in this men's group. And, you know, we, we pray together, we read some scriptures, do some studies. And then eventually the pastor that was leading that group he said, hey, guys, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna start keeping journals, <laughs> all right? So now <laughs> here's the thing. I'm like, no, 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 I, I'm not, a, that's a diary. <laughs> no, 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 it's a journal. I'm pretty sure a journal is a diary. So, <laughs> all right, so it's, you're, you want me to keep a diary. And so maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe, maybe journals are diaries. They're diaries, right? So, but anyway, I did it. All right, so I did it anyway for a while, and it was actually a really good thing to do. Um, I'm not really a journal kind of guy because my thoughts bounce around for a couple weeks. But what it did was it helped me focus and think about, you know, when I read something, how does that translate into the specifics of where I am today? So there was this little, little blurb at the end in this journal. And, and, you know, you write things down, and then it would always end with, how will I be different today because of what have I just read, what I have just read. And so when I read this, I'm, I'm trying to think, how do I translate this into San Francisco 2022, all right? Um, so here's what's not, not a good translation of this. In our time and place here, it's unlikely I would say that we're going to be asked to stone anyone for adultery, right? That, that's just not going to happen. I mean, people might get mad if we say adultery is wrong, but no one is going to ask us to really do that. But for sure, undoubtedly, we're going to be asked to mistreat or ostracize or devalue someone because of blank, blank, blank. They're liars. They stole. They were unkind. Or they're rude. They treat people badly themselves. Maybe they have a substance abuse problem. Maybe they're reckless and endanger other people. They disagree with us in a mean way. You could go on and on. Every one of us encounters the pressure from other people to mistreat people like that. Or we feel like we want to mistreat people like that. It happens, right? And so how do we translate how Jesus treated someone who was being looked down on, how do we translate into what we encounter today? It's not going to be killing somebody for, for adultery, but it is going to be making sure that no one likes them, that they are not connected, that their reputation is gone. And so um, here's what I, I would say, and this is just for myself, everyone has to find a way to 
do this themselves, right? If I'm truly serious about modeling what Jesus just showed us in that passage, then I should be prepared and know how I'm going to respond, either to someone that I feel like be valuing or when I'm under pressure to do that to someone else. Um, I'm kind of a mull it over kind of person. And so in the moment, I'm more likely to say, oh, uh, it's no big deal, right? When it is, right? Or I'm just likely to agree with people, say, yeah, <laughs> forget that person. You know, we, we should make sure they, they don't have any friends, that their, their, their reputation is ruined. Uh, if I'm truly serious about being better at that, here's what I, I, as I sat down and thought about this, I should write down how I would respond. I should maybe practice it. <laughs> Do I stand in front of the mirror and practice it? Do I talk with someone else and kind of work it out? Uh, this is really important. And so, uh, you know, I think a lot of us have had the experience, you know, we think, oh, yeah, I could defend my faith or I could respond in the way the scripture tells me to respond. And then in the moment, when you're trying to think off the top of your head, does it go quite that way? No. But this is important. And so maybe it's worth actually putting some work into it. Uh, if we're truly serious about modeling that. Now, that's just for me. I, some people are just like, you're so sharp, right? Uh, you could do that off the top of your head. But I think for a lot of us, it's actually worth thinking about this a little bit. Maybe we'll be more effective at modeling this kind of behavior and, and following Christ's example. All right, so then, then there's, there's the next part, all right? So this is the part where um, the Pharisees and Jesus kind of argue about, you know, who, who's really, you know, who has the authority here? And it just goes back and forth, back and forth, right? <laughs> you don't have the authority. Yes, I do. Yeah. So uh, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness isn't true. Saying you're just one guy who's saying that, right? So Jesus answered them and said, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came, come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. Jesus is making the case that his is not just another variation of flawed human judgment. Uh, he tells them, that's you judging according to the flesh, to you know, your whims and your needs. Instead, he's making the case that it's anchored in God's judgment. Uh, though at the time, they don't really understand who the Father is, says even the pastors. They didn't understand. They don't understand who he's talking about. They don't understand he's talking about God. Uh, when Jesus said he doesn't judge, he, he means in the way the Pharisees wanted, obviously. Uh, he did make a judgment earlier when he said, go and sin no more. And then later in verse 26, he literally says, I have many things to say about you and to judge concerning you. Um, so then it just goes on. It is also written in your laws, this is Jesus talking still, that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would know my father also. Then they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke of the Father. But we understand. So at the time, Jesus had not fully revealed that you know, he was the Son of God, right? But John gives us the, the spoiler in John 1.1, 1, 1, right? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus speaks as, with the authority of God. So um, he is teaching us, now that we know who he is, that that is where we should anchor our, what we feel is, what we know is the right way to judge, what is right and wrong in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of men, right? So coming back again to my attempt to apply this, because I always have to do that, otherwise it's just right out of my head, right? So. God's authority and judgment are absolute, but ours are subject to our own whims and flaws. We saw that in the first part of this passage, and it's worth repeating again. If we don't anchor this in God's true authority, 
we're going to make these mistakes. And since the scripture is God's word, one way to keep us on the right track is to make ourselves make a habit of asking ourselves if we are judging in a way that matches the example we see there. All right, so let me conclude with an analogy, a really forced analogy, by the way. I am reasonably certain you should not talk about chemistry <laughs> when you're giving a sermon. But here we are, right? So here's the reason I'm talking about this. I think about this all the time. It's my job, right? I, I obsess over this. So what this is, see this right here? That's benzoic acid. It's a really simple chemical. Uh, but this is actually a special batch of benzoic acid. It's called the, uh, the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, PS1, the primary standard for quantitative nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, that, that's weird, right? You don't care about it. I'm obsessed with it. But let me tell you what that is. This is an analogy for me. You're going to have to find your own. But let me, let me show you why I like this analogy. This is designed to be the absolute truth, so to speak, when measuring, when you want to measure how much there is of something that you're interested in, all right? And so when they sell this to you, for a lot of money, by the way, <laughs> um, they check this in so many different ways. You could, you could almost call it multiple witnesses, as they were talking about in this passage. They use very careful light absorbs. How much light passes through, how much absorbs, you know, we're going to quantitate this really exactly how, and determine how pure it is. They use really, really expensive, elaborate mechanical scales. I mean, scales that cost over a million dollars each, right? So they use other methods. They compare it to other standards that are considered to be uh, impeccable as well. And all that together, they combine it and say, we're sure that we're selling you something and we know exactly how much of, the, of it is in there and how pure it is. Still, there's still some uncertainty because you can't know everything about the physical world. So why is this important? Well, you want to be anchored in that when you're actually using it for something important. Don't worry about this too much. This is a spectrum of a drug that's in development. These things right here, those are going to hurt you if they're present in quantities that are high enough. So when we're developing this stuff, they ask, is that there in a safe level or is it too high? I could pull something off the shelf, some bottle that's been sitting there for 10 years. I could try to compare it to that. Maybe if I don't like the answer I get, I'll pull another one off. And maybe I'll find something that will get the answer we want. People do that all the time because that makes your management happy, right? Say something safe. But let me ask you, if you were about to take this drug, would you want us using that quantitative standard that's not changing, not going to age and sit on the shelf? Or do you want us to keep testing and testing until we, we can say it's okay? The answer is you want to be anchored in something. Uh, if you're not, you're going to be tempted to keep changing things until you get what benefits you. Mm -hmm. And so that's my example here because I deal with it every day. We all got to find our own analogies to remind ourselves. Um, but in my mind, God's word is our primary standard here in terms of judging. Our whims will change. Some days we'll be tempted to mistreat people and do things for our own benefit. But what God teaches us in scripture does not change. Mm -hmm. And so uh, thanks for putting up with, <laughs> with a little chemistry here. It's what I think about every day. And you know, I think kind of finding something you can relate to often keeps stuff in the front of our heads. That's how I did it. You guys... I don't know. Find something else that, that works for you, um, but I think we can do things to remind ourselves of that. All right, that's all I have to say. Let me let me pray, and then I'll turn it back over to, to Jake. Dear Lord, um, thank you for today and that we could get together as a church and um, worship you and look at your scripture. And I pray that this week um, you would put things in our lives that we could apply this scripture to whether it's people that need um, us to interact with them in the right way or lessons to be learned, that you would give us a chance to put this scripture into practice and for it to become a habit that is glorifying to you. Uh, we pray that um, you would 
Bless the rest of the week and keep us safe. In your name, amen.